So in our last lesson, we discussed subgroups, but not all subgroups are created equal. And so now we're going to be discussing what are known as normal subgroups. And so in the non-abelian case, when things are non-commutative, these are the best subgroups that we can hope to have. And so let us begin with just a quick review. So in our last lesson, we defined the notion of a subgroup. And so we had that an equivalent form of determining whether a given set is a subgroup of a group G is via the subgroup criterion. And we just have to verify that the set H, along with the binary operation of G, that it is close under products or inverses or another equivalent form that we have X circle Y inverse is in H for every single X and Y in H. And so the first topic we're going to discuss is the notion of group homomorphisms. And so with a group homomorphism, we're looking at specifically maps between groups that preserve the group structure. And so in many ways, you have already seen this in linear algebra. Linear transformations are example of group homomorphisms, except that linear transformations have added structure. You need to preserve that scalar multiplication, that k, that if you have k times a vector, when you apply the linear transformation, then you will still have that that k will follow through and you'll have that property being preserved for scaling. With group homomorphism, all we care about is the preservation of the binary operation. And so let's go ahead and make that precise. So we have two groups, G, with binary operation star, and gamma with group operation uh, diamond. And let us go ahead and denote their identities by one sub G and one sub gamma respectively. Then a group homomorphism going from, it's defined to be a map, a function that goes from G to gamma, that is a well-defined map that satisfies this preservation property of the binary operation. So if we take phi of x star y, this is going to be equal to phi of x diamond phi of y for every single x and y in G. The image of the group homomorphism phi is just those elements in gamma that have an input in G that maps to them. So in other words, a is equal to phi of g for some g in g. And now the kernel is defined as all those elements in g that map to the identity in gamma. And so here we're using multiplicate, uh, the identities are being viewed from a multiplicative perspective since we're writing one, but the identity could be zero. When we have the integers, it's a group, we, it, we can view, that's a group under addition. And so in that case, this one sub gamma would be actually the zero that we are used to. And so the kernel would just be all the elements mapping to zero, which is how we think about kernels in linear algebra. And so the notation here is specifically, since we're thinking about these operations multiplicatively, but again, it could be addition, in which case the ones are zeros. And we have the following proposition that tells us that if we have a group homomorphism phi going from g to gamma, then we have that phi of g to the n is equal to phi of g quantity to the n for every integer n. We also have the kernel of phi and the image of phi are subgroups of g and gamma, respectively. Now, I'm going to go ahead and just do a quick verification here to illustrate that this is just a consequence of how the group homomorphism is defined. If we take g, phi of g squared in the notation that we have up here, that would be the same as saying phi of g and then star g. But since phi is a group homomorphism, this will go to phi of g and then diamond phi of g but that will be phi of g squared. And so I leave it to you to verify the general case. So let us suppose that phi is a group homomorphism going from g to gamma. For any a in gamma, we're going to denote the inverse image of a to be the set x of a, which is equal to the set of g's in g, such that phi of g is equal to a. And that, of course, is phi inverse of the set containing A. This is also called the fiber of phi over A. And to visualize this, the following picture helps. 
So let us go ahead and take G to this be this box here. Gamma is this quadrilateral down below, and so we have a, our function, our group homomorphism, V, mapping from G to gamma. And if we fix an A in gamma, then we can visualize the fiber of V over A to be this fiber right here. And that's that red strip, that is X of A. And the way we want to interpret it is that these are all the elements in G that are, ma that are mapping to A. Now this picture is a bit misleading because it gives the impression that there are multiple elements in G that map to A. It could be possible that nothing maps to A in the event that the function is not surjective. It could also be that only one element in G maps to A. But this is just a visual representation of the fiber. And so this X of A is some strip in G. But as we look at all the X of A's, we're going to have a bunch of other fibers. And if we take their unions, that's going to give us back G. And so these fibers are going to partition their group G. And so we denote by G bar, the fat, the, to be, G bar is the set consisting of all the X of A's where now A ranges through the elements in gamma. And this can also be interpreted through the language of equivalence relations. And just as a comment here, G bar is, is, defi is uh, defined as the fibers of V. But now let's think about this through equivalence relations. So let tilde be the following relation on G. G1 is related to G2 if and only if V of G1 is equal to V of G2. You can then show that this relation is reflexive, it's symmetric, and it is transitive, therefore an equivalence relation. And one of the things that we have with equivalence relations is that the set of equivalence classes is a partition of the set on which the relation is defined. So all these X of A's partition, um, partition G. So if we take the union of all the X of A's as A is in gamma, this is going to be equal to G. We also have that these are all pairwise disjoint. X of A intersect X of B is empty whenever A is not related to B. As a side note, depending on which text you have learned partitions from, as I mentioned earlier, some of these X of A's could be empty in the event that nothing was mapping to A. Some authors define a partition as a family of sets where each of the sets is non-empty. And so we are having a looser definition for what we mean by a partition. Namely, we take the union of the X of A's, and that's going to give us back G, and they are all pairwise disjoint in the notion that we have A is not related to B. And now we get to the proposition. So we have our groups G and gamma, we have our group homomorphism phi, and now we're going to let K be the kernel of phi. So the first statement of the proposition is that X of A is equal to G star K, which is the same as K star G for any G and G such that phi of G is equal to A. So what does this mean? This is being used in the same notation that we used in the previous lesson on subgroups. So we have G, and then we're applying it to every element in K, and that will give us a new set. But that set will be equal to taking K and then applying G to it. And so we have these equalities. We have G bar as a partition of G, but that is going to stem from the fact that we have an equivalence relation. But the crucial thing is this here, that we have a map circle going from G, G bar cross G bar to G bar. And what it does is it takes X of A comma X of B to X sub A diamond B. And so we give, this gives us a way of extending now our binary operation so that it's on G bar. And finally, we have that G bar comma circle is a group. And so that gives us now a structure for G bar, which we call a quotient group. And so, or a factor group. And so we can write this as G bar is equal to G mod K or G modulo K. Now, if we have that H is a subgroup of G, 
Then we have, as I mentioned, as this is now the notation that was introduced in the g star k equals k star g. So g star h is the set of g star h, where now all the h's are elements in h, and h star g is h star g, and then h ranging in h. And so we call this here a left coset of h and g, and we call this one here a right coset of h and g. And so an element in, of either of these sets is called a coset representative. So next we have our g bar, which is equal to g mod k under this new notion. And we have the following coset decomposition. So we have g is equal to the union of the x of a's where a is in gamma. But x of a from the proposition is also equal to g star k, where k is the kernel of, of gamma and it's also equal to k star g. And so now we have the union of the x of a's is equal also to the union, but instead of having a in gamma, it's just g is now in g of g star k. And because of the equality of x of a, that's also the same as doing k star g as g ranges through the elements in g. So let's do a concrete example we're going to take our group G to be the integers under addition. We're also going to take our group gamma to be a cyclic group of order n. So here we have the group generated by x, and it is order n, so we are assuming that x to the n is equal to e, where e is the identity of gamma. And we're going to define the following map. So we're going to have phi of G to gamma, where an integer m is mapped to x to the m. This is a group homomorphism, because if we take phi of r plus s, that maps to x to the r plus s. But exponent rules then gives us x to the r, circle, x to the s. But now we have x to the r is phi of r, and then x to the s is phi of s. So we have phi of r, circle, phi of s. And we have that the definition of a group homomorphism is satisfied since we have this preservation property with the corresponding operations. So we had addition for our uh, for the integers, and diamond is now a circle where we're looking at a cyclic group of order n. Now we're going to use the following fact. If we have x to the m is equal to e, then it must be the case that n divides m. And as a consequence, the kernel phi is going to be all the multiples of n in the integers. And to recall, kernel of phi is all those elements in the integers. And so we're looking at this as g in the integers, such that phi of g is equal to e. But then this here is those integers such that phi of g is just x to the g. And so now we have x to the g is equal to e, but then because x to the m, in this case x to the g is equal to e, it must be the case that n divides g. And so we're looking at all those g's and the integers that are divisible by n, and so we will get that this is the set of numbers of the form n times k, where now k is an integer, but this is nz. And so we have our kernel. So now we're going to look at the image of phi, and that is going to just be all of gamma, because we know that 1 maps to x. And now we have that the image of phi is going to be the group generated by x. And so phi is a surjective mapping. Now let us suppose we have an element x to the a in gamma, and we're going to look at the inverse image of x to the a. Well, that is phi inverse of the set containing x to the a, which by definition is those integers m, such that x to the m is equal to x to the a. If we compose on both sides of this equation by the uh, multiplicative inverse of x to the a, then we have that we're just uh, taking x to the a circle x to the negative a on both sides of this. And so we have x to the m minus a is equal to e. 
So in other words, n divides m minus a by this fact that we are assuming right here. But if n divides m minus a, that is the same as saying that there exists some integer k such that n times k is equal to um, m minus a, which is the same as saying that m is equal to a plus nk. And so this is now written in shorthand notation as nz plus a. But we have that the sigma group of order n is just e x x squared, and then once we get to x to the n minus 1, the next element is x to the n, which is back to e. And so from this here, we have that there are exactly n fibers x of a, since we have all the possible remainders that are less than n. So we have our a is equal to 0 corresponds to e, our a equals 1 corresponds to x, 2 corresponds to x squared, and then we have our fibers. So we have our n fibers. And so x sub a can be identified with the element x sub a, and in this manner, z bar is what we have the integers modulo n of modular arithmetic. And now we, that we have defined group homomorphisms, we can turn our attention to normal subgroups. And so some examples of normal subgroups are the kernel and the image of a group homomorphism. But to make all of this precise, we're going to have the following proposition, which will allow us to define normal subgroups. So we have our group G, and we have our subgroup K of G. Now the following are all equivalent. There exists a group homomorphism from phi going from G to some group gamma, with K as the kernel of this group homomorphism. We can also bypass discussing group homomorphisms entirely thanks to 2, where we have that G circle K is equal to K circle G for each G and G. Returning to the terminology that was introduced in the previous lesson, we have that the normalizer of k and g, denoted n sub g of k, is exactly g. And so that's just a restatement of this here, of 2. And finally, we have g circle k. Circle g inverse is a subset of k for every g in g. And so whenever any of these four properties is satisfied, and therefore if one is satisfied, all of them are, since they are all equivalent, then we say that k is a normal subgroup. And so that's our definition for a normal subgroup. Satis anything that satisfies those equivalent conditions. And now we write this notation here to say that k is a normal subgroup of G. So next we're going to define the notion of the commutator of two elements. So let G be a group, and so the commutator of two elements in G, let's go ahead and call them G and H, is denoted by bracket G comma H, and it's equal to G H, then G inverse H inverse. And with this, we can consider the commutator subgroup, which is the group generated by all the commutators of G and H, as G and H vary throughout the group G. Then the normalizer of the, of the, um, of the commutator subgroup is back to G, and part of the assignment will have you investigate the commutator in further detail. And during the synchronous lesson, we're going to actually work out this example here in detail as well. And so I'm just going to sketch some of the ideas that we'll discuss further. And so it turns out that the commutator subgroup is always a normal subgroup of G, and when we specifically look at the dihedral group, we can define the dihedral group in terms of the commutator in the following fashion. So we have that it's, as before, the group generated by R and S, R to the N is the identity, S squared is the identity. But now we can replace S, R, S equals R inverse with now the commutator of R and S is equal to R squared. And then the induction, we can then show that S to the P circle R to the Q, which is equal to is equal to r to the q circle s to the p. 
in terms of q, where now q is negative 1 to the p times q. And if we now apply the commutator to s to the p circle r to the q, and then s to the a circle r to the b, this computation that we will show in our synchronous lesson will be equal to r to the 2n. And this will allow us to conclude that the commutator subgroup is generated by just r squared. And consequently, the order of the commutator subgroup in the case of the dihedral group is going to be n over the greatest common divisor of n and 2, since we have that it is generated by r squared. And so we'll talk about this in further detail um, in our synchronous lesson. So to finish off, let us now take a subgroup h of the center of g. Then, it, the normalizer of h will be exactly g. And this is stemming from the fact that if we, if we are in the center, that means that all the elements in g commute with the elements in h. And so from here, it's not hard to prove that then h must be normal in g. And so in particular, the center of g is normal. And moreover, if we take two normal subgroups in g, it turns out that their intersections are also normal in g. And similarly, the union, the, the, the group generated by the union of n and k is also normal in g. And so during our synchronous time, we'll work on this in more expanded detail since there is a lot in this slide. And so we'll work out these examples out. Thank you for watching.